Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. 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 M1 Helmet Lot Numbers by Mark W. Giles In recent years there has been a growing segment within the M1 Helmet collecting community spending a large amount of time, discussion, and money on the helmet's visor stamp referred to by M1 Helmet collectors as a heat stamp or a lot number. One to older M1 Helmet collectors these numbers are relatively meaningless. While to the younger Google search generation they are often used as attempts to validate claims of authenticity for a specific helmet. Used as a tool of observation, the stamp identified which fabricator pressed the helmet or could help determine if a current hinged chin strap loop helmet did, in fact, start out with a fixed chin strap loop. Beyond this, the stamp had little meaning to collectors or any effect on perceived value until the fall of 2007. The tipping of the scale, from mundane to becoming a major consideration in determining the value of a given M1 helmet, coincides with the publication of a lot number chart claiming to pinpoint the pressing of a McCord helmet body to within a specific month of the year it was fabricated. Although the chart, in its description of use, claims only to approximate a date, and the book in which it was published provides no bibliographical support or explanation for how the author arrived at the charted timelines. A large section of the collecting community has adopted its findings as gospel. Historians have always put forth hypotheses regarding the specifics of history, however doing so without providing the source for one's published conclusions creates conjecture and misunderstanding. Was this chart constructed upon substantive data or were helmet stamps simply listed in sequential order based on dates derived from the sum of the characteristics of the helmet's component parts e.g.? fixed or hinged chin strap loops, front or ear seam rim, stainless steel or manganese rim, olive drab shade OD3 straps or olive drab shade OD7 straps. If the chart was developed using observation alone, how large was the sampling? Did the sampling allow for refitted helmets? Were all the helmets observed from original manufacturers applied paint or did some have post-factory applied paint, and then potentially other post-factory alterations? The real problem is that without a basis for understanding how the chart was constructed, the results can hardly be seen as reliable. Fervor over helmet stamping is obvious in online debates between M1 helmet collectors arguing for or against the helmet state of manufacture. Some sellers have resorted to taking sandpaper to original finish helmets to better discern a number and argue that value is based on the perceived manufacture date. This debate has even seized the reenacting community as evidence by requests for specific number ranges prior to purchase or dissatisfaction upon receipt of a helmet without a proper heat. Figure 1. Typical example of the of damage done to M1 helmet as a result of exposing the lot number in an attempt to maximize profit through perceived manufacture date. Figure 2. McCord M1 helmet body after initial 7-inch draw prior to the trimming operation. Note Visor Stamp 726C, Credit, Authors Collection, Mark W. Giles has been a member of the company since 2014. He graduated from New Mexico State University earning a BFA with emphasis on graphic design and a minor in world history, number for their chosen time period. So, what exactly is this number stamped on the inside of the M1 helmet visor and does it correlate to the date of manufacture? It was officially known as a lot and lift number used for traceability by the pressing concern in their quality assurance program. To best understand its function and how it relates to the modern day M1 helmet collector, it is necessary to examine the actual process that existed between a steel supplier and the helmet fabricator during the time. Figure 3. Carnegie Illinois Steel Corporation. Giant ladle pours molten steel into an open hearth furnace. Credit. Acme 14 June, 1940, Author's Collection Like its predecessors, the M1917 and M1917A1, the steel of choice for the M1 helmet was Hadfield's manganese. 
The steel used in the manufacture of the World War II M1 helmet was produced by two steel concerns, the Carnegie Illinois and Shire and Steel Corporations. Although the two concerns process steel differently, the problems associated with the manganese helmet steel produced was basically the same from both facilities. For the purpose of this analysis, only the relationship between Carnegie and McCord will be reviewed. The manufacture of Hatfield Manganese Helmet Steel at the Carnegie Illinois Steel Corporation began at their South Works plant where steel was melted in an open hearth furnace at 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit and poured into 15 ton ingots. These ingots, referenced by the mill as a batch of steel or heat, were much too large to be accurately tracked and shipped as a unit. Carnegie chose to reduce each of their heats by subdividing them first into billet 6 and then rolling them into 216 x 36 x 4 inch slabs. Each slab was cut into 336 x 72 x 4 inch sections and sent to the Airy Sheet Mill where they underwent several processes to include shearing, rolling, pickling, and austenitizing. Processing concluded with each slab having been reduced into a quantity of 256 x 34 inch sheets averaging 0.044 inches in thickness. Each slab, if free of defects, could yield about 2,000 helmet discs and was referred to by the mill as a lift, aid in order to retain traceability between a heat and each of its subdivisions or lifts, Carnegie first assigned a six-digit number to each heat, referred to by the mill as a heat of steel number. This number was used to reference records in the steel making process. Secondly, each slab was assigned a five digit lift number documenting the sheeting process and identifying each lift as belonging to a specific heat. Each lift of austenitic sheets was marked off with a grid work of 8 17 x 17 inch squares, each containing a circle drawn at 16 12 inch diameter. Each of the eight sections was ink stamped inside the circle with both a five digit lift number and corresponding six digit heat of steel number from which they were treated. Marked and stamped sheets were then cut lengthwise into two 17 x 68 inch strips and trim cut into 17 x 17 inch squares, before arriving at a circling shear to be further trim cut into a helmet disc each resulting 16 12 inch diameter disc that passed quality inspection was coated with oil and banded into bundles of 400 for crating and delivery by freight car. That the M1 helmet first went into production from which it was subdivided to McCord for pressing and fabricating. Figure 4. Carnegie Illinois Steel Corporation, employees at the Gary Sheet and Tin Mill cut sheets of Hadfield's manganese steel into a 16, 12 inches discs for helmets, credit. U.S. Steel Corporation Ref Department, Authors Collection. Figure 5. Carnegie Illinois Steel Corporation, during a plant tour, a finished M1 helmet is shown in comparison to the helmet discs from which it was fabricated, credit, Acme March 20, 1943 Authors Collection. Figure 6. McCord Radiator and Manufacturing Company, Detroit, Michigan circa 1935, credit, Authors Collection. Upon arrival at McCord, crates of helmet discs were assigned lot and lift numbers as they were received. This number was intended to travel with the helmet as a permanent record of the steel used in its manufacture. In its most basic form, the numbering system was created for the purpose of traceability between helmets, at any point of manufacture to that of the steel sheets provided by the steel mill. In essence, the lot and lift number was for quality control and used to identify all helmets within a particular lot and lift to that of the steel mills records on the lift and the heat from which they originated. Should any helmets from a given lot and lift present with defects or fail the prescribed bend, magnetic, microscopic, or ballistics test, all helmets manufactured from that lot and lift, as well as all helmets from the same heat, and although great care was taken to keep all the lifts of a given heat together during the manufacturing process, apparently little thought was given to the order in which any given lift was staged for production. Arsenal documentation indicates that the sheets of each individual lift were not loaded, shipped, received, or pressed into helmets based on the sequential order of their mill, assigned lift number or by the order that they could be identified and inspected for disposition. At the time this numbering system was developed, Carnegie Illinois Steel Corporation was the only steel provider and McCord Radiator and Manufacturing Company was the only fabricator. 
McCord originally developed this alphanumeric numbering system to document traceability between batches of helmet steel provided by Carnegie and that of the M1917A1 helmets they were fabricating at the time, 1940. McCord continued to use this numbering system when fabrication transitioned to the M1 helmet in. This alphanumeric numbering system was expressed as a series of numbers followed by a capital letter and accurately expressed as a lot and lift number. In correspondence of the time, however, the number is generically referred to as a lot number. The numbers were issued, in sequential order, to each individual heap of steel number received from a steel. Letter was issued in sequential order at the time each individual lift of a given heap was received for. For example, when the first crated discs from Carnegie's heat of steel number 255,799 arrived at McCord, they were assigned the next available McCord lot number of 596. As each subdivision or lift of the heat was unloaded from freight cars, they were received under the assigned lot number of 596 followed by a letter, beginning with the letter A, in this case. Carnegie's lift number 50,697 was the third lift received from this heat and therefore assigned the letter C, resulting in Carnegie's heat number 255,799 and lift number 50,697 equating to McCord's lot and lift number 596 C. Carnegie's lift number 50,695 of the same heat was the fifth lift received and therefore assigned the letter E resulting in Carnegie's heat number 255,799 and lift number 50,695 equating to McCord's lot and lift number 596 E. Simply put, the Carnegie heat of steel number correlates with McCord's lot number and the Carnegie lift number was represented by the letter assigned to the lift in the order it was received at McCord. It is important to understand that lot and lift numbers were assigned to crates of helmet discs upon receipt at the fabricator and not in reference to the day that sheets were pressed into helmets. Multiple lifts were received at McCord on a daily basis for conversion into helmets fabricator received the lifts. September of 1941, Processing Figure 7 Helmet discs arrive at McCord bundled 400 per unit labeled with both the Carnegie heat of steel number 255,799 and a corresponding Carnegie lift number. Each lift comprises about 5 units totaling approximately 2,000 helmet discs. McCord receives Carnegie's heat of steel number 255,799 under the next available McCord lot number, 596. As receiving progresses, Units of discs of each Carnegie lift for heat 255,799 are unloaded, in no particular order, and received under a letter of the alphabet. As it turns out, Carnegie lift 50,697 was the third lift unloaded and was therefore assigned the letter C, 596 C, whereas Carnegie lift 50,695 was unloaded fifth and was assigned the letter E, 596 E. Figure 8. Carnegie Heat of Steel number 160,158 received at McCord under lot number 843. Carnegie Lift number 70,121 was assigned the letter D by McCord indicating it was the fourth lift of Heat 160,158 received. Credit. Author's Collection. Figure 9. McCord Radiator and Manufacturing Company. Manganese steel discs from Carnegie Heat of Steel number 155,643 are formed into a helmet in a single operation at one of many drawing presses. Credit. Library of Congress April, 1942. Figure 10. McCord Radiator and Manufacturing Company. Stamped and trimmed helmets made from Carnegie Heat of Steel number 254,904 travel in a continuous chain conveyor on their way to receive a rim. Credit. Library of Congress April, 1942. Fig 11, McCord Radiator and Manufacturing Company, a helmet visor from Carnegie Heat of Steel number 245,912 is cold worked in a spanking operation, which bends the visor down a small degree. Credit, Library of Congress April, 1942. Of their assigned lot and lift number. Prior to staging helmet steel to the production floor, a quality inspection was performed on sheets to verify their ability to accept the necessary deep draw without breakage. The helmet discs of each lift were required to meet the prescribed bend, 
magnetic, microscopic, and ballistics test specifications as first outlined in SPEC AXS 645 and later in SPEC AXS 1170 that passed inspection were delivered to a small punch press where each was embossed with a fine line stamp. After receiving a lot and lift number stamp, sheets were delivered to large presses that pressed them into a 7-inch deep pot. From this point in the fabrication process until the helmet body received paint, each helmet body visibly had both the Carnegie heat of steel and lift number stamping as well as the board. Schluter Manufacturing Company of St. Louis, Missouri June 1942 to August 194,517 altered the McCord lot numbering system with the addition of a capital S to differentiate helmets of their manufacture from those produced by McCord. Parish Press Steel Company of Reading, Pennsylvania, March 1945 to August 1945 differentiated their helmets by stamping a capital P. After receiving a lot and lift number stamp, Sheets were delivered to large presses that pressed them into a 7-inch deep pot. From this point in the fabrication process until the helmet body received paint, each helmet body visibly had both the Carnegie heat of steel and lift number stamping as well as the board. Schluter Manufacturing Company of St. Louis, Missouri, June 1942 to August 194,517 altered the McCord lot numbering system with the addition of a capital S to differentiate helmets of their manufacture from those produced by McCord. Parish Press Steel Company of Reading, Pennsylvania, March 1945 to August 1945 differentiated their helmets by stamping a capital P. Another modification to early lot and lift numbers arose from experiments performed to resolve issues like age cracking. Age cracks were fractures in the helmet body that occurred over time after a helmet had been manufactured. They were due to residual stress left in the steel from being cold work 20 into its pot shape and were caused by both the quality of helmet steel and the cold working necessary to shape the helmet and achieve its required ballistic strength. Records from Watertown Arsenal indicate that tests were conducted on steel of varying formulas at McCord, and on an edge annealing process at Schluter, in an effort to stop the formation of cracks. When tests were authorized, the pressing concern would receive the sheets from the mill assigning the heat as standard lot and lift designation with the addition of a number after the alpha suffix to segregate the lot from the control. An example of this was a test performed to determine the effect of edge annealing on age cracking in the helmet visor. Discs from Shire and Steel Company heat number 73191 and Schluter lot and lift number 213 BS were pulled and separated sheets lot and lift number stamp in front of the lot number into two test groups 213B2S and 213B3S. 213B2S was the control and was manufactured under current standards while group 213B3S had the brim annealed. Figure 12. Seam welding applied to the visor of the M1 helmet during experiments attempting to prevent age cracking. Credit. Watertown Arsenal Laboratory Report WOW 710-612 April, 1944. Arsenal records provide little insight to specific pressing dates. They relate that all McCord lots of 55A or below were manufactured prior to January 24, 1942. McCord lot 88 was pressed on April 8, 1942 lot 148 on July 24, 1942, and lots 863 and 865 were pressed on August 19, 1944. When the dates of known examples, like those above, are compared to the date they should plot on the aforementioned chart combined with the fact that lot and lift numbers were assigned to helmet discs upon receipt at a pressing concern not when they were fabricated, and with the knowledge that lot and lift numbers were quality control tools used to connect helmets to the records of the steel manufacturing which would have been considered irrelevant in a production environment unless the steel presented with a defect. The deficiencies of this or any chart attempting to divine the date of a specific helmet's production becomes evident. In fact, even with answers to questions on the rate of production as compared to the rate of receipt, knowing if discs were staged direct from receiving into production or if they were warehoused and, if so, how they were stored 24 would only serve to further convolute dating helmet production by lot and lift. Lot and lift numbers are a valuable tool when used within the confines of what is known about them however, precluding actual production records from pressing concerns. 
A lot and lift numbers can contribute to the date of pressing as a ballpark guess dividing helmets into early, mid, or late war categories. Perhaps one day actual pressing records will surface. But until such time each M1 helmet collector historian must answer for himself how to handle lot and lift numbers as a divining rod or as a tool. Figure 13. Typical thin line stamped lot and lift numbers found in helmets of World War II manufacture. Note the lack of an alpha lift suffix in several examples. The reason for the lack of a lift letter may be as simple as the quantity of helmet discs provided for the pressing was a small enough subdivision of the heat from which they came and was therefore unnecessary. This was certainly the case regarding the experimental TS-3 helmet, which was a contract for a quantity of 200 complete helmets. Further research may one day definitively answer this question. Credit. Author's collection. In a seam. All credits to Mark W. Giles and other people who gave this information thank you.